Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Julia DeLapp, and I'm the director of the Center for Early Childhood Education here at Eastern. Um, and I want to welcome you, those of you who are here, as all, and also our live YouTube audience who is watching this as we stream it. Um, so I'm welcoming you to the, this event to announce the results of the 2019 Timpani Toy Study. And this year it's kind of special because this is the 10th year that we've done this study. So it's the 10th time we've announced the results. Um, and so we wanted to do something a little special this year. So next door in the Child and Family Development Resource Center, we have set up an interactive toy museum. So it features 30 of the most remarkable toys from the past 10 years. And just like in a real museum, this is, these are uh, shots of it, just like in a real museum, there are little placards ne next to every toy giving you a little information about what made each toy special, what children did with it. But unlike a typical museum, children are allowed to touch the toys. <laughs> And in fact, they're encouraged to actually play with them. So they were visiting the museum last week. Their families were encouraged to visit as well. And there will be um, children visiting today so you can see it in action and get some photos and videos of that. Um, and then another thing that we wanted to do today in honor of 10 years of studying toys was honor all of the students who have been part of this. And so you'll notice that going up the stairs, there are photos of 37 students who have been involved in this study in one way or another over the years. <laughs> So 26 of them were involved as research assistants, but then also we had 11 students who were communication interns, video production interns, who helped us create the videos that get the word out to the whole world about, um, about this study. Um, there were three students who helped with this year's study. So it's finals week and there's student teaching, so not everybody could be here today, but I want to at least acknowledge Allison Lundy, if you could stand up. Yeah. Um, so Allison is, um, this is the second year that she worked on this study, and while she was working on the study, she was also doing her own study for her honors thesis. But she worked with Shyantini Nandi and Alyssa Berry, um, and they were responsible for doing all of the video recording of children playing with the toys. They then watched the footage multiple times to code the quality of children's play. They entered the data into SPSS. They helped with the analysis of the data. They created a very professional looking poster um, illustrating the results of it. And then a couple weeks ago, they came with us to Nashville to present the results of the study at the National Association for the Education of Young Children Conference. Um, so thank you for all that you have done for this. Um, the students who have been part of this um, over the years, so we actually had an event for them last Friday because they can't come to a press conference in the middle of the day because they are working. Um, a few of them have gone on to research careers, but most of them are teachers in their own classrooms now. And they are working with children from infancy up through third grade. And so they are now applying in their own classrooms what they learned from working on the timpani study. And that's really the whole point and why we involve students in this research, particularly undergraduate students. Um, because as part of their liberal arts education here at Eastern, they get to have a meaningful experience where they are implementing um, in their own classroom what they learned. Through that research, they have become better communicators, better collaborators, and better critical thinkers. I also want to acknowledge the um, communication interns. So Emily Dennis is standing in the back helping with videotaping. <laughs> So she was our video production intern this semester, and so she joins many, many interns who've worked at the Center for Early Childhood Education over the years. And along with our video production staff, Ken and Sean, they have helped us get all kinds of research information and best practice information to teachers all over the world. And in fact, while we were in Nashville presenting the results of this study, we got word that our center's YouTube channel hit two million views. So it really is, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, oh, there it is, there, yeah, so two million. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge our research partners because we could not do this work if it weren't for the Child and Family Development Resource Center. So um, can I put you on the spot and have you guys stand up? Yes. <laughs> so, um, 
thank you. Patty, Heather, Claudia, Alicia, all of the um, teacher associates, and Nilifar, the director, um, we, we couldn't carry out this research without your cooperation, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to acknowledge the administration because we could not do this research without their ongoing support. Um, they make it possible for students to participate in the research and also to go to the national conferences, which I think is such an important opportunity for students. So, um, so thank you to them, and especially a big thank you to our president, Elsa Nunez. Um, and I would like you to join me in welcoming um, the president up for a few remarks. For me, the Timpani Awards signifies you gotta go Christmas shopping. <laughs> So I panic. I was happy it was postponed <laughs> from the snow last week, but uh, in reality, it does signify the season of, of giving and uh, and uh, being with one's family and the joyousness of the holidays, whether it's Hanukkah or Christmas. Uh, but I want to tell you that presidents take a lot of credit for things, and behind the scenes, it's always somebody else that does all the work, and we get to go to the podium and say a few words of greeting. In this case, it's Julia DeLapp. This, this would never have happened if it hadn't been for Julia's commitment, her uh, dedication to the stu student researchers and the students from the communications department, but also her love of, and passion for the work that uh, faculty does with students and she really really understands the importance of undergraduate research and what that benefit has for our students and so this project is not just about identifying a toy but it's about the process by which students learn how to think critically as you heard her say work collaboratively and develop their research skills so that they can use all those research skills when working with children in the classroom so Julia to thank you <laughs> is not enough we want to acknowledge all that you do for the center and also for this project. Thank you. Um, so we're here today as a result of our 10th annual tim timpani toy study. Ten years ago, we started the empirical research that has been recognized by educators across the world. Congratulations to all the students. It's wonderful. I'm glad you did the Wall of Honor. To the faculty who's here and the faculty who's not here who participated, and of course to the staff who have worked on this project during that period, during the decade. Today is a milestone. When we started the Timpani Award uh, uh, study about a decade ago, my two grandsons were preschoolers. And I always watched, you know, the announcement of the toy, and the next day I went out and bought it, and uh, Julia, Julia told me, or sent me the links usually, so I could do it fast. But my, those two boys are now uh, teenagers, uh, but my daughter has three daughters, so I still am buying the toy that is announced each year. This is always an exciting day for me as president of the university, not because I'm president, but because I'm a grandmother. As we approach the holidays, I know that parents and grandparents alike are pouring through catalogs, they're looking online for reviews, and once again asking themselves, what do I get these kids? What toys are safe? What toys are useful in terms of learning? What are the most educational toys I can buy for my children or grandchildren, or nieces and nephews, or ch children of friends? Will the kids play with the toy for five minutes and never touch it again, which is always one of my fears. The Timpani Toy Study has developed a well-deserved reputation for answering these questions over the decade. It has become an Eastern tradition in the process while advancing the research skills of our students. Timpani has earned its reputation as being provocative, data-driven, and empirical. Student research on this campus, and we are proud of those elements. It's innovative and complex. It's led by the faculty <clears throat> as it should be. The evaluation tool is criteria-based so that the results are scientifically grounded, and we defend the result that we announce by showing the empirical data. We know that larger Research One institutions focus their, research, their resources and research efforts on working with graduate students, but not at Eastern. In fact, not many undergraduate students get to conduct criteria-based behavioral research, but at Eastern, it is happening every day on this campus. And our students don't just participate in the research as assistants or silent observers. They actually are central to the gathering, analyzing, and reporting of the data. 
As Eastern students have done each year, the timpani study has been in existence. Our student researchers presented their findings two weeks ago at the annual meeting of the National Association for the uh, Education of Young Children. And we're proud that they go to that conference and present their results. Presenting their findings in front of a national audience is, an imp is as important an accomplishment as conducting the research itself. This year's timpani results are interesting as usual, but I'm not going to reveal them in advance. I will tell you this, each year the winning toy, and this year is no exception, has been unique and different. Yet, all have given children the freedom to explore their iman imaginations and grow. For the past 10 years, my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Traywick Smith and his students have been keenly engaged in significant empirically based research to invest investigate what toys are best suited for developing children's cognitive and social and language skills. Thank you, Dr. Traywick Smith. I will tell you this, when he told me he was retiring, I panicked. I said, oh my God, there goes the timpani study. What are we gonna do? You can't replace a guy like Dr. Traywick Smith. And then he promised me that he would come back till the day he died. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> He's terrific and you'll hear from him in a minute. It is gratifying to know that Eastern's timpani toy study will be used by educators and parents throughout the United States and abroad to inform their decisions about children's playtime activities. As much as the unveiling of the selected toy is always an exciting day, I continue to be impressed by the methodology used by our student researchers, video-based observations assessed against a carefully crafted scientific-based rubric. Most compelling are the consistent findings of the study over the past decade. That open-ended, low-tech toys have the greatest value in advancing the skills and development of young children. And we try to publicize that because people think it's all the techie toys that engage students, and it's quite the opposite. In addition to Jeff, I want to congratulate our student researchers on this year's study. You already met uh, Alyssa Barry, Sanyatani Nadi, and Allison Lundy. Make, I'm sorry, Allison Lundy is here, not, not Alyssa Barry. Let's give Allison another clap. <laughs> you make Eastern proud while adding important data to the science of early childhood education. These students are to be commended for their painstaking data collection and analysis, as well for their commitment to children. I also want to, think, uh, to congratulate the uh, teachers from the center who are always cooperative, as Julia said in the study, and I never get one complaint from any parent in the center. It's all because of these wonderful teachers. Thank you. Before I pass the podium over to Dr. Trawick Smith to announce this year's winning toy, I want to encourage the news media present to visit our child uh, and family center immediately after the program. Julia described the museum that we put together for today. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you to each of you for being engaged in the work of our undergraduate students and with the faculty and staff. Thank you. Thanks, President Nunez, as always. Uh, the kind of the inspiration for all of this, I would say. Um, before I uh, started on what I'm supposed to be doing today, <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a quick comment about the event Friday evening and all of the students who had worked on timpani over the years. So this group came, I spoke to every single one of them. They're all, they all have great jobs. They're all incredibly successful young career women. And um, they, every single one of them said two things. They said Eastern was you know, just an incredible uh, university to attend. They all, every single one of them said this was the place where they really grew professionally. Um, and they also commented on the opportunity to do research in the center, which I think kind of suggests that this experience really is something that's unique uh, to, for undergrad students. So I just wanted to share that. Now, what I'm supposed to do is talk a little bit about um, kind of what we've learned over the last 10 years, which is not an easy thing to do, by the way, for two reasons. One, we've done this for 10 years, but the other is 
we always find such quirky, odd things when we do this study that it's hard to kind of look for patterns in a way. But I've done my best to kind of identify some things that I think we can conclude from uh, the 10 years that we've been doing this. The first, and it's probably the broadest and most basic, is toys really matter. Uh, that the kinds of toys we provide to children make a huge difference in terms of their play, in terms of their development. Uh, so the, the idea here is that it's important to give some careful thought to what children are playing with. Uh, to give a quick example, uh, in one of the studies uh, some time ago, we found that Duplos, you know, the preschool age uh, Legos, um, scored incredibly high. In fact, they scored higher than um, you know five other toys that were tested. And so uh, the idea was that these are pretty powerful toys. But what was odd about this is that they, uh, these toys scored twice as high as a very similar kind of toy, uh, which are called tree blocks, I think. Um, and they look pretty similar. Children do kind of similar things with them. And yet there was an incredible difference in their impact on children. This says to me that toys, that not all toys are created equal, that some toys have a greater impact than others and on individual <laughs> children. So I think, um, you know, if nothing else, I'm going to say I'm pretty proud of, uh, you know, what we've discovered, the impact we've had just in kind of um, emphasizing maybe out there in the world that toys really are important. Um, I also want to comment that almost every year, well, every year, really, we have identified what I'm starting to call super toys. Uh, Elizabeth Prescott, who did research some time ago on uh, various materials, found that uh, she called them super units. Uh, these are toys that, oh, I keep pushing the wrong button here, that absolutely do everything for children. Uh, you know, they are, uh, they do it all. Um, if, for example, one year we studied Tinker Toys and we found that they inspired high quality play in learning and problem solving, creativity, language and social interaction. You just can't go wrong with Tinker Toys. And so our, um, you know, our thought was that these are a set of materials that ought to be in classrooms. They ought to be in homes and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, some toys, though, I think it's important to note, are specialized. They were really great toys. They're well worth purchasing if you're a family or, uh, you know, including in classrooms because they do maybe one thing but do it really, really well. Uh, for example, one year we uh, studied, uh, they were called multi-solution table puzzles. These are very cool because you can interchange the pieces across different uh, puzzles. Um, and what we found here is they scored incredibly high on thinking and learning measures, but not as much on social uh, development and language. Children tended to do these more on their own. Um, so the idea is that um, some toys are really important, but not, they don't do everything. Uh, nonetheless, I think a good balance of some of these kind of materials in a classroom or at home would be a good idea. Um, another one where, uh, this is another example, are, was a toy doctor set, which was really um, amazing in its uh, inspiration of uh, make-believe or imagination, uh, social interaction, but not so much thinking, learning, problem solving. Children just pretended with these. Uh, nonetheless, you can't imagine a classroom or even a home where there wouldn't be some of these kind of pretend play props that kind of inspire these specific areas of learning and, and um, development. Then finally, there were some toys that are just not so good. <laughs> I, you know, every year we find toys toys that are expensive and then I'm sure families purchase that just don't do it. Um, for example, some of you know this, this uh, material, um, the super moose balancing game. Here's what we learned from this particular uh, study, that real children, not like the ones, the models, you know, in the photo, the real, real children don't smile when they're playing this game. <laughs> It's just, well, I mean, if, if nothing else, it was impossible for them to use. By the way, these are all designed for preschool-aged children. So, um, so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that toys have a different effect. Some are great. Some are great at all things. Some a few things. Some not so much. 
Um, this, uh, uh, President Nunez had commented on already, but I think it's important to say again, it seems like super uh, simple, rather, non-realistic, open-ended toys are powerful. And I love giving this example mainly because uh, these toys, no one, none of us, no adult thought were going to be, uh, I don't think, uh, were going to be, um, uh, you know, powerful in supporting children's play and learning. Uh, so they got absolutely the highest scoring toy. You could include them in that category of super toys, and yet adults couldn't believe it. I mean, even, I mean, I think even at the end of this study, we were saying, really? Do, really? <laughs> uh, but... Notice they're simple, they aren't realistic, they don't uh, um, elicit any one kind of play, but rather can be used in infinite ways. And actually, this kind of demonstrates what we found over and over, that these simple toys tend to be uh, you know, particularly uh, effective. Um, one thing that we have found is that toys that are not very popular, and by that I mean you put them in a classroom and children don't choose to play with them much, and yet they are really, once children play with them, they are really effective. Uh, one good example are bristle blocks. Uh, these are very common blocks, and it might be that they were so common, children were so familiar with them that they chose not to play with them as much. But they didn't, and yet they were one of the highest scoring toys. They scored high in all areas. They just didn't choose to play with them much. Um, what we uh, have felt uh, is that this sort of suggests that Sometimes adults need to kind of guide children toward activities, play activities that are especially beneficial to them. You know, if you see children using a material uh, that's really, um, you know, uh, in a really elaborate way, but they don't use it much, it might be time to kind of scaffold a little bit to kind of support uh, children's uh, use of that particular toy. On the other hand, really popular toys did not promote development so much. Um, here, I'm going to just go off a little bit <laughs> and show you this. Um, if you don't know who these two are, you're not on planet Earth. <laughs> really, I mean, these are like, you know, it, like at Frozen 2 is out now, so it has it kind of built back up. The, but one thing I want to point out is that these talk. They talk, they sing. Uh, so these toys, uh, I bet, will be purchased by lots of families, you know, and I bet they're kind of expensive. I don't know the cost. But I love to just kind of for a moment, if I could diverge, share a study that was done by my colleague Doris Bergen. What she found is children use less language when playing with dolls that talk. Um, that they use more language with just regular dolls that don't, you know, where they get to do the talking rather than the doll. Um, and she even found, which is kind of interesting, the same dolls with the batteries removed cause children to start talking more. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of like toys that do the playing for children don't always do so well in our particular uh, study. And yet, they might be incredibly interesting to children. So I always say, especially for, for families, you know, thinking carefully about the toys, because you will get, as uh, you had described, uh, President Nunez, uh, the uh, toy that lasts about two days, and then it's just sitting there, and it's like, what, we, what can we do? You know, the, the, the toys are scattered about the house, and none of them are that interesting. Um, so, um, one of the things that, uh, one example of this is, um, don't these look neat? I, I think these would be high quality toys that would prompt all kinds of play, but, and they were used frequently, but relatively little play value. Um, I think these kind of fell apart or something, didn't they? I can't remember. <laughs> that may have been part of the problem. <laughs> anyway. Um, another thing I want to just comment on, I'll kind of speed this up a little bit, um, is that we should not completely discard toys that we used to play with. By the way, when I say we, I mean all of you in the room that are way older than me. That was a joke. I mean, these are things that I grew up with, and yet we found them to be still quite powerful. Uh, one of the highest scoring toys of all time in our 10 years were a set of hardwood blocks. And by the way, um, we've done additional studies, uh, block play studies, that find a really strong connection between block play and mathematics learning. So these are really valuable, and yet they've been around forever. Um, actually, I can tell you the history of this, but maybe we won't. <laughs> anyway, another one. 
this is one that caused a lot of people uh, consternation. We, we went to, uh, we presented this at a conference, and people just, you know, especially some people believe wooden toys should, you know, and natural materials are, are best for children. And when they saw it, it was Hot Wheels, they were kind of disturbed, and yet they are really powerful. I mean, the children really played with them in elaborate ways. And I played with these. Um, I can say that my children played with them, left them all over the house so that I'd step on them with bare feet. They really hurt. You know, so, I mean, you know, it's like they're everywhere. <laughs> Um, you kind of wonder where all those went, if there's some landfill somewhere where all of the Hot Wheel toys are laying. But you get the idea here. Sometimes thinking back to your own play experiences and thinking, you know, it might be interesting to, um, you know, like explore the impact of some of these uh, tried and true uh, toys. Um, we've always found differences with, uh, in terms of gender and cultural background and the toys children uh, enjoy. For example, um, uh, I always like this one. We found one year that a, a toy tool set uh, elicited really high quality play for girls. And we thought this is kind of neat because this is maybe um, you know, different than what you might expect, you know, in terms of gender or stereotyping or whatever. On the other hand, boys, you know, played at a much higher quality level with uh, Lincoln Logs. So the idea here is that you have to kind of pay attention to what individual children uh, like to play, but also that inspire their high quality play. Um, then we also found cultural uh, differences. Uh, Latina and Latino children uh, played at a really high level with these. Uh, I told somebody, these are my favorite toys ever. I mean, they capture everything that's great about what we've studied, which is simple toys. There's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, you know, specific feature that would cause you to play in one way or another. Children use these in hundreds of different ways. And on top of that, and by the way, in a study I did in Puerto Rico, I found this also to be the case that Children on the island pl did this kind of rec replica play a lot with doll houses or little people, little cars, little, uh, you know, uh, figures of all different kinds. Finally, and I'm kind of sticking my neck out here, but these, the, in final conclusion about this first 10 years is that there are two types of uh, toys that no children should be without. The first are construction toys. They just do well every single year, building toys with boys and girls, kids of different uh, backgrounds. Um, and we're going to come back to the magnet tiles. They scored the highest, um, but we'll come back and talk a little bit about some issues with that. But building materials seem to really work well. By the way, I'm just, you know, this is why uh, students, I, my classes always used to run over, you know, because I just keep saying, oh, but there's one more thing. But I just came across this, I have to show you. So these, this is the brain, this, actually it's a composite, I think, of a brain, of a child who has spent uh, five sessions with blocks. And that little thing that's lit up there inside the brain is the region of the brain that's responsible for spatial knowledge and spatial reasoning, and it's lit up. And this is after they've played five times with blocks. So the idea here is that there is a real impact on these construction, uh, of these construction toys. The other one I add are replica play toys, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes, but toy animals, so simple and probably less of expensive than some of these others, were really great in eliciting high quality play. Uh, you know, doll houses and little people. Also, we include small cars with this. Children would play out these elaborate make-believe uh, themes. That uh, The one on the upper, I guess your upper right hand, the little signs and vehicles, was the highest scoring toy the first year that we did this study. So I'm just going to do this fast, but we still have a lot of questions that we'd like to ask. One is, you know, what is the role of teacher-child interactions in toys? Uh, we have in the past, and you know, looked at toys without much guidance from teachers. You all put them out, and we saw what children did to kind of isolate the you know the toy itself. But we, I'm I'm really curious about you know uh, looking more at the role of teachers in this. Um, uh, the other one, I'm going to do these two real fast and uh, together. 
there have been more and more studies that look at how we get children of diverse backgrounds or of different genders to play together. Um, and also, we've, you know, one of our students did a study, and we're wanting to look at this a little bit more, how children who speak different languages play together. And there was kind of emerging research that toys may make a difference, that a particular, like I, I believe like, I'm just kind of making this up, but uh, pretend play props, for example, do tend to bring together children of diverse backgrounds. So that's an interesting one. Um, I also think we have ignored pretty much uh, children with disabilities. Uh, you know, our, our center right now doesn't have many children with disabilities. So, you know, we haven't looked at that. But I think, uh, and I'm not just talking about um, accessibility, although that's very important. I'm talking about what kind of play inspires uh, the make-believe of children with autism. You know, are there specific toys that will do that? Um, I'm kind of doing this. I'm, never mind. Um, so the last thing, I'm just going to end with this. Um, we do have a concern about what you might call a play deficit between children who live in middle class homes and those who are of low socioeconomic status. Uh, I, I mentioned the Magda tile, so wonderful for children price those out. Um, I sent a set to my, uh, my nephew's kids. They are really expensive. And, you know, maybe for school that's great. But, um, you know, we need to be looking at the, whether there are versions of these toys, you know, kind of analogs that are affordable. Um, you know, I can think of that, uh, you know, kind of helping uh, to keep the cost of toys down, or recommending toys that are less expensive. And I also think, uh, you know, there are now lots of toy lending programs where schools will invite uh, bags of toys to come into the home uh, so that you kind of overcome this. So anyway, that's kind of my, those are my thoughts. Sorry if I went on a little longer. I think this is longer than I thought. But um, I think now what we're going to do, you want me to start this? is get to the study itself right now. For thinking and learning, we were mostly looking at um, children's thought processes with the toys. The kind of play they are doing with the toys, how it is helping them to think about it. How they explored the toy, um, where was their problem solving, did they you know, really try to figure it out. Were they asking questions? The highest scoring toy in thinking and learning is the waffle box. Waffle box are these square pieces. They look like waffles, but some of the pieces are curved. There were some that were triangular. They interlock, so they're almost like a puzzle piece because the pieces connect within each other and then they could connect front to back. I thought it was remarkable for their engineering skills. I think one of the challenges children had was figuring out how to put them together. I have a window. They kept trying to problem solve and build on one another's. and So I think like their brain was just constantly going and just trying to figure out everything that they could make with it. And because it was so open-ended that the learning really just never stopped. And then it closes if the monster tries to bite the frog. For creativity and imagination, we were looking at the different ways children use the toy, so if they were using it for its intended purpose or if they were using it in a more novel or unique way. How a child can transform a toy into a completely different thing. We also looked at if they created a play narrative. Play narratives are like stories that children create. These are imaginary scenarios that they carry out in a make-believe world. We had a tie in this category. One of the highest scoring toys in creativity and imagination was the family counters. So the family counters are miniature people. They have like adults and babies and then there are cats so it resembles a family. I'm the daddy. Sometimes they color coded them, sometimes, you know, they grouped them by the type that it was or the size of it. You could almost look at them like math manipulatives. I got two kitties. Two blue kitties. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six orange. I got six yellow. A lot of 
of times children use these to carry out family play narratives. That was what I saw the most with this toy. I put your skull on. Okay, come on, baby. It's time to go to toddler school. That's what they see in their homes, in their families. Okay, have a good day, baby. We, we, we get to your new teacher. They were collaborating. They were um, working together to put on this more elaborate play narrative. The other highest scoring toy was the Waffle Blocks. I think Waffle Blocks did well because children did transform it. They used it to create things that didn't necessarily resemble the block itself. They created structures resembling towers or houses. And I think that when children transformed the Waffle Blocks, that was when they were most engaged. What's that? If, if the monster coming, if it closes, so the monster will escape. Oh, but you still have to have a pickaxe. You know, so it was just amazing to see where their mind took them with those. It was so open-ended, and they had that ability to just make anything with it. There really was no expectation. So for social interaction, we were looking for how they interact with their peers when playing with the toy. Were they parallel to a uh, peer? Was, was it associative play? Was it cooperative? Were they working together to play the same thing? If their interactions with their peers are positive or if conflicts arise when they're playing with the toy. The highest scoring toy in the social interaction is the puppet theater. So the puppet theater itself is really unique because it's not just puppets. The theater is really what stole the show. Amelia, we need it up and we'll have a show. Wait, I'll cut it up. Children, they love to roll up the curtains and roll it down again. In the backdrop, you could reverse, so there were different scenes on both sides. I found often they were exploring the puppet theater together. I think it's backwards, or I think this goes up. And within that, I think we saw the highest levels of just cooperation. Yes. Um, we have to go over there to watch. What? We have to go over here to watch. I think puppet theater did so well in social interaction because a lot of time they were working collaboratively to kind of set up this puppet show and then also perform it. Guys, the puppet show is starting. They would do the puppet show and a couple of them would pretend to be the audience. It's a sunny day. So for verbalization, we were looking at any utterances children make while using the toy, making noise or talking. Oh my God, it's not freaking. So it's sound effects, it's, you know, making noises and singing. Yeah. Were they able to have conversations with their peers? Did the conversations last? One of the highest scoring toys in the area of verbalization was the family counters. There were a lot of play narratives that came along with family counters, so in order to convey those play narratives, they needed to verbalize. Now it's time to go, girls. Come on, baby, come on. Children role-played with all those miniature figures. They came up with scenarios they see around them in their homes and environment. It does replicate something that they've had past experiences with. We're almost there. It's time to go. They have that knowledge that they were really able to like expand on it and vocalize what they were thinking. Hello, I'm here to get my babies. No, you can't get your babies. They're, they're running. Learning? Mm -hmm. The other high-scoring toy was the puppet theater. What should we do today? Maybe. When they were putting up the puppet show, uh, there were a lot of verbalization. If we don't have the background on, then we won't have the show. They had a theme for the show that made provisions for a lot of verbalization. We can do the mommy and I do that, and I'm this baby. So with them putting on the show, they're not only talking to each other about what they need to do, but also talking in order to put on the show and convey their ideas to their audience. And I bite, and I bite. <laughs> Okay, 
So now is the moment we're waiting for. The 2019 Timpani toy is Family Counters. <laughs> yeah. Um, so please feel free to take photos while I kind of wrap things up. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming here today. And what you saw, the video, that's just an excerpt of the full video. So if you'd like to see the full video, which has information about the study methods, as well as more information about why this particular toy, um, it will be up on our website later today. Um, that's our website. Um, and then before we go, I did want to thank the people who made today's event possible. So facility staff who move all the furniture and also take care of the ice outside so we can all get here safely. Um, media services to make sure that we've got audio and video and sound and all of that. And also university relations. Um, and then um, most important is um, I want to thank the staff of the Center for Early Childhood Education who make all of this work possible. So Ashley Anderson, Terry Supernant, Ken Miesemer, and Sean Lesser, thank you for all that you do. Our researchers will be available to answer any questions and um, and please take a moment to read the quotes um, because students did take the time to tell us what being involved in the timpani study meant to them so you can read those up on the wall and then um, the interactive toy museum will be open for people to take photographs and video of children playing with toys thank you again